coming to the action or operation of with reference to the athletics of racing or games, the, the manner of action of a particular performer or a racehorse or whatever, um, but also generally one's characteristic manner of acting or reacting. So it's a, a manner of doing something. Like that. That's a, a very complex definition. Um, there's more, there are other more formal ways to define style. Um, if you ask someone who does martial arts, so what style of martial arts do you do? You might hear the answer, karate or judo or esquema or taekwondo or this sort of thing. These are all styles of martial arts. But if you talk to a karate practitioner, uh, you might ask them, what style do you do? And the answer would be Shotokan or Shotokai, Shotokuro, Kyokushin, Kojirayu, whatever. Whatever school of karate. That's also sometimes called a style. So, the style can mean the martial art, it can mean the particular type of a man of martial art or in the way that, that martial art happens. So, it's not a very, not a very easy word. Um, I'm thinking to myself, why do some people look good when they do Kima? And it's simply because they have style, they have class. They do it well. Uh, why do some people look more comfortable when they do Kima? <coughs> because the style that they've chosen to perform their actions simply works better. Uh, a, lot, a lot of my students look very uncomfortable when they start learning. And gradually, as they learn the style of what I'm doing, everything becomes much more comfortable and much more fluent. It works better. Um, or why does it look more effective when they do Kima? Why does it look like some people are just tapping each other and other people look like they're actually cutting each other? Well, it's the style and the, the way that they're doing things. So style can be the difference between um, it looking like sport dancing and it looking like you find that why, why do some people look like the illustrations when you do Kima and why do some people not look like the illustrations? It's because, well, the people who do look like the illustrations are taking the correct kind of positions. They've got the right sort of flow and movement in their body and they've got the right style for what it is they're studying. So, style is a difficult word. It can mean all sorts of different things. And it's really impossible to talk about style without first defining what you mean by style. And even when I discuss this with some of my co-instructors and some of my friends back in Glasgow, we all have a different idea of what style means. And that makes it much more difficult to do a rational and helpful discussion. So there are different styles of martial arts, and each art has different styles within it. That's a possible problem. Each and every practitioner also has a personal style that's unique to him or her. But some people maybe have a more aggressive or former style of doing things, some people play more defensively. Um, some people are quite lazy with what they do. They just kind of stand there, and then you come into this and they hit you. And it works very well. And that's their style. But style can mean lots of different things. I think the best definition is from the Cambridge Essential Dictionary, which is a way of doing something that is typical of a person, a group of people, a place or a game. And I think that the best human practitioners have a distinct and recognisable style when they practice. They look like they know what they're doing, they look like they can be effective, and it looks well, a good style. So, to give some examples of how we can come to, uh, how we can build an idea about different styles. We're going to add a few different sources. And um, please bear with me. Each analysis is worthy of its own two hour debate. So I've just put a few summaries of roughly what I think about each of these sources. And you might disagree. You might agree. I would love to discuss this sort of thing later in much more detail if you're at all interested. If you're not, then don't worry. So, we're going to start by looking at some of the long source sources and then we'll look at some of the sort of longer sources and just see what conclusions we can come to about these. Uh, so, let's start by looking at the theory. It's a very simple and effective system. It doesn't have lots of long sequences. 
when you look at Paul's hectometer, for example, it's just, um, if he does this, then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this as well, and then you also do this. They just built up these massive sequences. He only keeps it short and simple and effective. It's all about keeping yourself safe. Um, you don't really put yourself out here. You don't do something that makes no sense. You just take a calm and logical approach to things. You do what keeps you safe. You keep it simple and effective. Whatever you do to the other person has to be lethal and or definitive. Um, Fury doesn't really seem to deal very much with these simple slicing or pressing actions that find in general swordsmanship because they're not really definitive. They don't really finish things there and there. Um, what, what Fury does best is effective and, well, lethal strikes or if something happens, a good parry, a good cover, followed by killing the person. Nice and simple and effective and lethal. Um, you have to keep your body well structured if you're doing theory properly. One of the, the interesting problems we see with a lot of people who try to do the, the German styles is that often the body ends up in simply the wrong kind of structure. It doesn't quite work properly, it's not quite strong enough, it cannot quite deliver the powerful sort of cut that you're looking to deliver. Um, a lot of Fiori's material is about keeping your body well structured. And an example of this is when you're doing a strike, you keep your wrists in this kind of open position. You don't do this kind of crossed wrist strike that we see in the German sources. The moment your wrist cross, um, be it with a pump or a, a spit or something like that, the body structure becomes a lot weaker. It's harder to, to deliver a more powerful cut. And, well, it's very easy to disarm a person if their wrists are, are crossed. So if you, only, if you keep yourself well structured, you do not give the other person a chance to take advantage of your body weakness. So you don't have any body weakness. And finally, you should be assertive without being overly aggressive. Um, one of the, the old themes about the German schools, it's, it's all about attack, attack, attack. And the Italian school is all about defending yourself and only ever parrying and then doing something. It's not quite right. That's not right at all. Um, Fury is about setting yourself into the fight at the right time and doing the right thing without being aggressive and exposing yourself. So if you're fighting in a, a Fury like style, what, what you'll be doing will be simple and effective. You're keeping yourself safe without exposing yourself. You're making sure that whatever you do, will end the fight. Keep yourself well structured, don't give the other person any chance to, to grapple with you or to disarm you because you've crossed your arms or you've stepped into the wrong place or you're doing anything awkwardly. And you're assertive, just not pushing the person too much. I think that's what the way style is. You might disagree, I'd love to chat about that later. Looking at the very core Lichtenauer style, working from the HS 3227A, you can distill that entire manual down to a few points. Use the five cuts, the five master strikes or secret strikes or whatever, at the right time. He says that you don't need to use anything else. If you know what you're doing, just these five strikes will be enough to keep you safe and to beat everyone. Which is wonderful. So, if you're fighting in Lindner style, maybe try to restrict yourself to using these five cuts. And do the other cuts as you need, certainly. If that's what needs to happen for you to win the fight and to get out alive, do the other cuts. But there's a greater reliance and a greater emphasis on these five cuts. He only really uses the four guard positions that he believes are useful and safe. You've got the tools guard, the hands are drawn, it's all down here. You're ready to cover yourself, you're ready to do whatever. You've got the plow here, again covering the torso and keeping yourself safe. The ox, again covering the high part of your body. The Vontag here is preparing to deliver a powerful strike. Other masters have all kinds of different cuts, uh, different guards and statuses, but doing things in the style of Lichtenauer means keeping it um, a bit more restricted and only doing what works best. Other things work well, but Lichtenauer thinks that these four positions work best of all the positions. Because in this 
understand the timing of the fight. It's not just about throwing yourself in and attacking. It's not about standing back and just doing the correct ones in five uh, special cuts when you see the opportunity. You've got to understand the time of the fight, you've got to learn how to insert yourself in the, the before, you've got to learn how to deal with the after, and you should learn how to work instantly, perhaps in the binds or by using other strikes, and take the initiative away from another person. So it's about controlling the timing of the fight. Put your pressure, then put your opponent under pressure and use this to your advantage. So ideally you want to be in the before, pressure your opponent, you are going forward, you're inserting yourself more into the fight than perhaps the theory does. But it's just it's pressure, it's intelligent and sensible pressure, and it's not mindless attack. And finally, you don't do anything unnecessarily. Keep everything short, smooth, efficient and effective. So for example, winding the binds. You try to hit someone, the other person binds with you. Rather than taking this long motion to come round to the other side, you just do the correct winding motion and you stab them. Nice to the point, it works. Fury, um, Fury is about keeping it short and simple and good structure. Lifner is about efficiency and only doing the best possible response, the best possible things, just making it as advantageous as possible for yourself. <coughs> Going a little bit further down the Lifner tradition, you put the uh, second ring egg. It's mainly the same as Lifner, but with a few differences. He, if you read that treatise, there's more interest in playing with the, the nap, playing with the after. Uh, it's not all about keeping the, pre the pressure in the before. Some of it is about how to play with the after a little bit more intelligently and to give you a bit more options of what you can do. He advises more guard positions than core lifting up stuff. But again, this gives you more options. Um, it's a very similar source. It should all be about the swiftest possible way to get from A to B, make it the most efficient possible way. But there are more options and more choice than a more pure lifting our style. Looking at Talofa, we know for a fact that he was aware of Lichtenauer's system and, and the Mark Nerfs. Um, but his style is not really that of Lichtenauer. It's quite different. There's lots of unique material, lots of quite interesting things you don't see in the Lichtenauer, the more normal Lichtenauer sources. There's lots of cheap and dirty tricks, like the whip. Everyone hates the whip. Um, it's, a, it's a cheap and dirty trick, and you'd never find Lichtenauer doing that because it's not the most effective and most efficient way of doing things. You wouldn't find it um, in Ringek because, again, Ringek is the same, roughly the same kind of style as Lichtenauer, just with more options. Talhofer is different, it's a completely different focus and emphasis of what he's trying to achieve. And a quip might be a very good way of finishing a judicial duel. Other person stands here. You wander in, you go, whip, person loses his leg, you win, done. Um, he's got lots of cheap and dirty tricks like that, but they work in his style. Uh, another interesting point is that there's more attacks on the left than are usual in Lichtenauer's system. In Lichtenauer's system and in sources like uh, Ringex, you're told you should always start from your dominant side because that's where you're strongest. If it comes to bind, you've got to do something else. You shouldn't start from your weaker side, because here, it's weaker in the bind. Um, the cross wrist going on is structurally not as good. The Talbot has lots of strikes from the left. That may be part of trying to confuse the opponent, or give them something they're not uh, used to dealing with. Or there may be another reason. Regardless, there's a lot of attacks coming from the left, so that's an element of his style. There's just lots of variety in the techniques and sequences. It's not like you can flip through the book and go, ah oh, yes, this all makes sense. It doesn't. <laughs> you have to spend some time thinking about it. And trying to come up with a coherent system for Tavok can be a bit of a nightmare. So, but I think his style is just lots of, <coughs> lots of things that you can do, which works in his style. Looking at Paul's Bear, for example, again, it's different from the earlier stuff. He strikes around a lot, from side to side, from high to low, not really working in the bind anymore. He does have elements of winding and working in that straight line between you and your opponent. But most of his texts will suggest, if 
good type of person, he parries, do something else, come round, go back on the load, do something. That is quite different from the early Lake Nero system, uh, although there are still some similarities. He uses the hanging guard as a defensive parry and also as a static guard position. Um, hanging guard is rather than an opt to point forward, the, op the, the tip is kind of down to the side of it, so it's it's hanging, you're hanging under it. I find it very useful because I'm a short girl, so I can hang under a hanging yard very easily. Um, but in the earlier, these nerve styles, the point should always be towards the person when you parry. Whatever it is you're doing, you keep that point towards the person so that if a bind happens, you can shoot forward or otherwise get the point into the person. By taking a hanging yard and if someone attacks and you catch it here, the point's facing the floor. You can't really stab the person, you've got to come around as a result. So because part of his style involves motions where the point is not towards other person, it forces a different style of play, a different sort of way of approaching the fight. Uh, one of the interesting parts about this long stop system is that often he moves from different positions into an ox or a hanging yard or cover while stealing distance towards the opponent. So if you're quite far away, rather than taking a shuffle or two and then doing something, um, it's almost like I've got three in various ways. It's almost like taking an obsessio. Um, if the person's in long tag on his right shoulder, then you might step forward through a hanging guard to get closer, and then from here, you're covered against that attack, and then you can come in and do what you want to do. So that's, he has a lot of examples of stealing distance under cover which is not found in the earlier styles. That's an interesting one. And finally, it, what, what makes Polysmere really Polysmere is if plan A doesn't work, whatever plan A is, follows up with a, a tear or a cloak. Every play, every single sequence, if plan A doesn't work, he does either a tear or a cloak. <laughs> so, these should be your default backup options. If you don't hit the person, do it here or do it all. And that is, that, that, that's going to pause me in a nutshell. Um, lots of striking about place, keeping the point offline away from the opponent, stealing distance, and always having a good plan B. It's quite a good style, I like it. Looking at you from there, again, a little bit later, uh, further away from the, the core like their style. Again, he's striking around quite a lot, not really working in the mind so much. Um, and indeed, some of the strikes hits it flat to get the, the natural bounce in the blade to help it come around and do more stuff. Um, so that, that, that's an example of an element of his style where he's putting some emphasis on this element of style by using the flat to get the extra bounce to come around. Uh, he's really emphasising the advantage of being able to cut to any of the openings as they become available, no matter what it is you're trying to do, but an opening becomes available which you that's a wonderful skill. It's a very hard skill, but it's a wonderful, very useful skill. If you're doing something and an opening presents itself, hit him there. Lovely, job done. It's a useful skill. Doesn't really do much winding in the mind. It's a little bit, but not really as much as in the, the early source, sources. There's not much thrusting. Um, some people say that there's no thrusting in there. Some people say that, yes, there is thrusting in there. If you read the treatise, there are references to thrusting. He certainly threatens it a lot. Whether or not you think he does thrusting is up to you. But if, you, if you're not going to thrust anyone, or at least if that's not the main part of your system or your style, there's not really much use in winding. Because from here, a bind happens. If you wind up, the most natural thing to do is just to push it forward and poke the person. Uh, you've got to do something a bit more complex to strike <coughs> using windings in the mind or slicings. It's a bit more difficult. So if, you, if there's not much thrusting going on, winding is really not that useful a thing to have in the style. Which is why we don't, I think we don't really see much winding in there. Um, we know that he had a lot of knowledge of the Mayer system, but I believe that the Mayer style was a much more personalised style not slavishly adhering to the earlier system, but he made his own system, he personalised it, uh, and he also evolved
evolved it to suit the, the new social context because it wasn't for the judicial duel anymore, it was for schools, it was for teaching youngsters or teaching soldiers or whatever. But this new social context meant that maybe the, the older core link in our system would not have been appropriate. So the style had to change to make it appropriate. Also, the type of sword you have forces a different way to use it. Um, I, I find examining the grip very, very interesting on a sword. Uh, I wrote, wrote a blog article about it. Um, if you look at what I call a, a two-hand grip, so for example, something like the Hadley Classical Hand and a Half, or one of the Rollins and Death Logs of the Wheel Power, you can get two hands on the grip. And that kind of limits your options to what you can do. If you've got a three-hand grip, something like Albion Mayor, or the Rollins Synthetic with the Sense Doctor Hall, you can get three hands on the grip, and that means a bit more space between the hands. You can do more interesting things with it. You've got one of the longer grips, like the Standard Fader with the Kirigeni, or one of the Rollins Long Swords with the Long Hall. You can get four hands on it, and that gives you even more options. With one of the two-hand swords, it is most comfortable when you strike forward and then can wind and get that point going forward. So if you try to strike from side to side with a two-hand sword, it's just awkward. It's painful, it's just not much fun. <laughs> so the style for using a shorter grip on the sword is much more forward and direct. And that's what we see in the earlier systems. Uh, one of the medium grips, one of the freehand grips, you can strike round quite happily, but you can also wind and use leverage and work in that straight line. I think the Albion Mayor is perfect for doing things like ring X system. It gives you the opportunity to strike round if you need, and it gives you the opportunity to strike into bind, lean up, and use your windings. One of the longer forehand grips, like the Gany Fender, is wonderful for doing Palace Mayor and Yoko Mayor. It gives you the ability, plenty of leverage here, to strike round and do all this kind of stuff. Maybe it doesn't handle quite so well in the bind as one of the shorter grip swords. I find, personally, it's, it's hard to, to wind effectively with one of the, the, um, the Regeni faders than the Galmi Bear. But, yeah, that's fine. You take a, a longer sword for the later systems and it complements the style. You take a slightly shorter sword and a slightly shorter grip for the, um, the 15th century stuff and that complements the style. And for the earliest styles, you take a shorter one. So, yeah, it works, I think. So, conclusions about the long sort of sources. Um, different types of sort require a different style to take advantage of how to use them. Yes, you can be practicing yoga there and be using one of the handy practical hand and a half. It's just not going to be much fun. It's going to hurt. The hands are just going to get in the way, the pummel's going to eat into your and it's just split apart. And yes, you can use one of the uh, Regenia faders for doing something like the Viori or the uh, Codex Dobringer style, but it likes to strike round too much, so it's just going to be the wrong thing to use for the earlier styles. The longer grips are the perfect thing to use for the later styles. Hmm. So, different swords, you can take advantage of them by using different styles. Different masters emphasised the different aspects of the art. Not everyone had the same point of view. The different masters all disagree on stuff. And they all emphasise a different aspect of how they fight. Different things are important. And that leads to stylistic elements that change the fight. Sometimes masters excluded techniques by choice. Uh, why doesn't Fury have a cloak or a tail? Why doesn't um, Ringek or Lichner have the same emphasis on the hanging guard or from, from Palace there or striking to the four openings like Newcomb there? Well, they thought that some things were important and some things did not fit their style or were dangerous for whatever reason. So they would emphasize some things and exclude other things. And the exclusions are particularly interesting.
is an interesting question. With enough study of the different sources of the different masters, could you find each exchange in a sparring match in the style of a different master? <laughs> could you find the first exchange like Fiori, the second like Ringek, the third like Lifter, the fourth like Talhofer, the next one like Paulusmeer, and the final exchange like Jochenmeer? Could you apply the stylistic elements of these different masters and change your approach to the fight and how you approach the game? It's difficult. It's quite fun. It really confuses your opponents. <laughs> <laughs> it really confuses people. And it's, a, it's a fun exercise. Um, it means you can test how well you understand the different ways of doing things and the whys of doing different things. Hmm. So, let's look at some of the sort of upper stuff. Uh, I-33 has the concept of obsessio. If someone is standing in a position, then you can just attack it, but that might be the wrong option. There's perhaps a better way to besiege the, the, the position and take advantage strategically to get in there. It's a little bit like playing chess. It's got a forward lean, which means the feet and the legs are less of a target, which means, stylistically, there's not really much strength in the legs. It's um, an upper body game, and that's a stylistic element. Really, it, it kind of boils down to the overbind or the underbind. If you come into an overbind with your sort of top other person, you do these things. If you're in an underbind with another person sort of top of yours, you do these things. And, well, it's, that's a, a main part of the system. As soon as you feel that you, you are in the overbind, you do one of the sequences that you already know. Um, it also has the, the element of the piece to do better. This is how the common defensor does his thing, and it's wrong because. This is how the priest does it, and it's better because. Again, it's an issue about making it as useful and as effective as possible. Uh, in a slightly slower pace, stylistically, it's different from other stuff because, of course, with legs not being a target, you've got to work up here much more, and hmm, stylistically, it's quite interesting, and it's a different way of fighting from other masters. If we look at Lincoln, sir, or sort of Butler, he has binding and winding in pretty much the same fashion as Lifter and Longsword. So, we don't really see that in Lifter 3. Yes, it is binding and winding, to some extent, but it's not the same way of um, approaching the bind, it's not the same way of thinking about the bind, and it's not the same point of view at all. It has many of the same concepts and principles that are found in the of all sorts. Um, things like dealing with the, the timings of the fight and well, feeling, feeling the sort of working with the, the strong and weak. Doing all the stuff you do with the of all sorts. It has an interesting concept of you take the sort of buckler high, uh, you threaten his face or his head, he raises his sword as a to protect himself, and then you go, aha! He cuts his legs off because they're open. And that's something a bit different from the knife after three stuff. This is quite a stylistic element of liquid stuff. You're trying to make the person move his sword up to somewhere so that you can cut him somewhere else. And often, you <coughs> threaten the head that the person puts his sword up to up so you can cut him in the leg. And so the sword of can set it, maybe a bit more so than the knife after three, which is kind of slavishly here until you need to do something. Uh, but you only separate when you need to. It's not like other styles where you know, you're only ever working here and they're doing two quite independent things. In the very first play, it says strike so that the pummel of the sword comes next to the thumb that's holding the buckler. And so the buckler is very much covering the hand. Except you need to separate so that you can well, cut the legs off or do whatever. It's a different way of approaching the fight, it's a different way of thinking about the fight. It's a different way of thinking about what you're trying to achieve in the fight, and therefore the style is going to be different. If you look at Talbot or Southern Butler style, the Southern Butler are used quite independently. They're, they're doing different things entirely. Like his long sort of style, it appears to be a collection of tricks rather than a single coherent system. If you look at Type 53, it's a sensible coherent system. If you look at Lignus, and it's a sensible coherent system. If you look at Talbot, and it's mad. <laughs>
However, it does lots of traps, the harm traps. A lot of the sequences involve some kind of parry, some kind of wrap, or trap, or grip, and then doing something. Also, the hand and the wrist is a major target to tell the system. If at any point the hand is exposed, the first priority is to cut it off. That's the first priority, and we see that a lot in his illustrations. So, stylistically, you're sniping the hand as much as you can. You're not doing a very good job of covering your own hand. You're floating about with your sword and buckler. Uh, and lots of tricks. But, it focuses quite a lot of emphasis on traps and arm gra grabs, so that you can control other person's swords, and then have fun with it. Conclusion about sword and buckler. Uh, perhaps Talhofer is more in line with a, a, a normal turn defensive of fight. Just a normal fence that does stuff. It happens. It attacks. Perhaps with a bit more emphasis on trapping the arm and controlling the arm. That's interesting. That's quite a, a good part of, the, of his style. Lignus is quite, quite a bit more defined than normal fencing and works very cleverly in the bind in a fashion similar to Lignus' longsword. So it's not just about hacking and slashing and stabbing and doing stuff. Uh, of course, try to make the first bite, but if that doesn't work, person parries. You work with the binds, you do the appropriate thing, and you kill a person. Nice and simple. I thought three is much more sophisticated. It requires a lot of mental discipline to apply the concept of obsessio in quite as strategic as possible. Or of these three systems, I thought three is much more like chess, and how long more like going for a job. <laughs> Very different style uh, proportion of fights. Let's contrast these conclusions again with the long sword conclusion we had earlier. Different types of sword require different style. Um, if you look at Paulus Cal's sword and buckler, he's using a long sword in one hand and a buckler in the other. So, hmm, although the sequences look a bit more like Talhoffers, what stylistic differences does using a different weapon make? Hmm. Again, different masters emphasize different aspects of the art. The, the priest who wrote Ica Free emphasizing strategy. Lignitzer emphasizing controlling the mind. Talmoffa emphasized controlling the arm with some kind of grab. And again, masters sometimes exclude techniques by choice. Uh, within our study, you find a different exchange in the sparring match. In the cell, must master if you fight the first round, like Talbot in the second round, like Paulus Cal, the third round, like Lignitz on the fourth round, like I got three. You have the, the control of your body and the control of what you're doing in a fight to be able to apply different stylistic elements. So, uh, good practice. So, why is style important? <laughs> uh, I've been talking about style for a little while now. <laughs> why is it actually important? Well, it's a way of doing something that's typical of a person, a group of people, a place, or a period. If we are training people to be as accurate and as authentic as possible to what is written in the sources, uh, and even to what is illustrated in the sources as well, then if we can identify an inherent style, then we should attempt to adopt this style in our practice. It's no use training, I don't know, let's say theory. It's no use practicing all of his techniques and all of his positions and all of that stuff. And then when you fight, just using stuff like Talbot, that's not really being honest to what you've been studying. Uh, if you want to do this as accurately as, and as authentically as possible, then style is important. If, if accuracy and authenticity are not important to you, <coughs> then it's not so much of an issue. If you just want to play with swords, then it's all fun. <laughs> but if you're interested in accuracy and authenticity, then the style is important. The style of any given master or source, if we don't know who the master is, uh, reflects how that master or source believes it was best to use the techniques presented within the treatise. Using the techniques from that treatise and the style of that treatise together can produce lots of very skillful fencing. If, you, if you're doing Fiori, you you've studied all of Fiori's techniques and postures, and they're using Fiori's style, it will result in a very simple and effective and lethal and decisive way of fighting. If you studied 
do all these techniques and postures, but you're applying you know, ligaments of some butter style, things are just going to go wrong because it doesn't work properly. Uh, another thing is that fighting the proper style makes it look cool. This is very important. Uh, it makes it look very effective. If we want to attract more publicity to what we do, to, to our arts, and if we want to convince people that what we do is a proper martial art and not just playing with swords, then we have to make it look right. If it looks wrong, if it looks kind of shit, then it's not a very good advertisement. It's not doing a very good job of convincing people, maybe other martial artists, that what we do is an effective martial art. We want to convince people that what we're doing is effective, that we are serious martial artists, and of course we want to attract new people to our clubs. We have to make what we're doing, when we do demonstrations for example, look good. It has to look stylistic, it's got to look classy, or sexy as Anthony says. <laughs> um, it's got to look effective. If it doesn't look effective, then why do it? If it doesn't look cool, then why do it? Style is a very important part of making it look right, which and just making it look right is very important to the development of what we are doing. Uh, I also think that things like double heads are much less likely to happen if we decide to follow the style of the original masters. A lot of double heads happen because although we know the techniques, we just do them wrong. We do them at the wrong time. We think, aha, I'm going to attack now, bam, ah, double heads. Whereas the style of the original master might be wait until there's an opening and then hit him, which results in not a double hit. So, even later, there's a principle of seizing the pot and putting pressure on another person does not mean attacking like an idiot. It means waiting until the effect time. Uh, it means taking opportunity as soon as it arises, and otherwise keeping yourself safe and looking for another opportunity to put pressure on your opponent. It's about being clever, putting pressure on the opponent, and not about making yourself unsafe. If you follow the style, things like double heads are less likely to happen, I think. Acknowledging when masters deliberately choose not to include certain techniques is also quite important, especially if you're into the accuracy and authenticity of what we do. Um, why doesn't purely include a pot? Well, the technique simply doesn't fit with his ideal of not crossing the wrist. There's no point in him saying it's important not to cross the wrists if he then says also do the crumb pop. It doesn't work. Uh, it also doesn't fit with his simple but effective style because the crumb pop, well, it's not simple. There's all kinds of discussions about how it should be, and it's not simple, so it doesn't fit the theory. It's very important, if you want to be honest about how you are studying sources and applying them to what you do, that you try to have some kind of integrity and respect when masters chose not to include something. Um, well, why, why doesn't Tal Tal have the concept of obsessio when he's doing sword butter? Well, it's, it, it doesn't need it. It's, it's not part of the style. If someone attacks, you simply grab it, deal with it, and kill it. Or if it exposes his hands, cut it off. You don't need to have this advanced strategic game going on if you're just looking to snipe hands. <laughs> uh, so, you need to be aware of what the master does include and what the master does not include. Working out that the master does not include in this style and working out why the master does not include this is a very interesting and beneficial exercise. <coughs> What if we ignore style? Well, uh, what if we ignore the style of original masters? Why can't we just adopt a, a pick and mix approach to learning Hebrew? Surely if we take the best of everything, then we'll have the best possible hybrid awesome system. Not so much. Because the masters chose not to use certain techniques for a reason. Well, why does the only master drop on its Why does I suggest you should only open with the, the five cuts and only use the five cuts if you can. Why not do some of the other stuff? Well, there are reasons why the masters come into their systems. We should seek to understand what the masters have in their system, yes, that's step one. Step 
Step two, work out what's not in their system, why it's not in the system, and step three, make sense of it all. If you know the guiding principles of any given system, and just try to hit the other person, it's fun, but not quite right. Um, we ignore a wealth of information and skill that is intended to keep us safe as we find. The principles are there for a reason. The, the stylistic elements are there for a reason. Uh, look at Yoko Meir with his, uh, his emphasis being able to straight around and hit any openings and pierce. Well, that's a lovely thing. Um, but you've got to do it at the right time, otherwise it's all wrong. If you just think, well, you can maybe say straight to all openings, and so you walk in and you're just striking everywhere, you're not doing it right, and you'll probably be hit as a result. The stylistic element is not attacking the four openings, it's being able to attack any four openings when it, when it becomes open. That's the stylistic element, and that's the clever part. And the stylistic element is not just attacking, doing it at the right time. That, that helps to keep us safe. If we ignore the, the bit that keeps us safe, double heads up. Sucks. And finally, uh, to put it very bluntly, fighters with no style just look rubbish. <laughs> it looks scrappy, it looks very poor, and it does not serve to give purpose for our art or for our own school. But you prefer to watch someone who's fighting looks like money strips, that looks effective, and that just looks, wow, that's cool. Or would you prefer to look at someone who just is just messing with the sword and looking shit? Well, you prefer to watch someone who, who's doing it with style. <laughs> so doing things with style is safer for you in the fight. It, it looks better. It, it can help to attract more students, more <coughs> practitioners of the art. It helps. It will help to give us more respect from practitioners of other martial arts. Style is important. So. Thoughts for further study? These are the bits that you can take home and work on yourself. What are the guiding principles of the discipline that I study? Think about the, the discipline that you study. What are the guiding principles? What are the, the main rules of the system? Not the techniques. Techniques are building blocks. But what are you trying to achieve? What are the, the principles? What are the, the emphases? of that system. How do you understand the style of the discipline? Could you, in the pub later, explain the style of your discipline to me? How, how, how could you build uh, a definition of the style of your discipline? <laughs>